Welcome back. And from that cogent discussion there with Victor on matters CBC and the different implementation process therein, we now train our focus to something a bit different, but still of concern and of interest to us in our country that is looking at the drought situation, intertwining it with the climate change and what forms center of our conversation is looking at land restoration to mitigate climate change. This is what my guest is set to unpack for us in the next 40 minutes. That is Jacqueline Kemboi who is a um, landscape restoration coordinator at Just Dig It Foundation Kenya. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me in the studio. Yeah, let yeah. me tell you, I just had to pause a bit when I was doing Just Dig It. Lest again I say Just Digging It. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, it's Just Dig It. Yeah. <laughs> it's Just Dig It. Yep. Let's just start from that particular point, Jackie. Let's understand what Just Dig It is all about and what exactly it does. Yeah. So Just Dig It is a Dutch uh, NGO mm -hmm. foundation uh, whereby we do uh, landscape, uh, landscape restoration on large scale. And our main focus in, is on the arid and semi-arid areas. Mm -hmm. And with this uh, um, landscape restoration intervention, we uh, promote the use of uh, simple, uh, cheap, and affordable technologies where people can just, by knowing them, they can adopt and use them so that they can you know, reverse the impacts of climate change mm -hmm. in their area and also create a microclimate in their uh, area and have, you know, pasture, for example, for their livestock, forage for their livestock, and also, you know, yeah, food for their families. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that this is a Dutch company. Of course, yeah. it has roots in Kenya. Yeah. Talk to me about when this was established in Kenya and what has that progress been like? Yeah, so Just Dig It has been in Kenya since uh, 2015 where we've been having active projects in Kajado mm -hmm. and now we have an office in Karen. Mm -hmm. So with now having an office in Nairobi, we are able to monitor and, you know, implement more and more interventions in the country. So uh, as of now, uh, we have, as I said, that we started in 2015. So we have projects in Kajiado and we are uh, focusing in the Chulu area, the Amboseli area and the Magadi area and our main aim is to you know regenerate, uh, bring back vegetation on degraded landscape so that the Maasai communities can mm -hmm. be able to get pasture for their livestock and be able to you know adapt to the effects of the drought mm -hmm. and climate change. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, you also talked about asal areas, and yep. this is a term that we've had over time, particularly from the Red Cross. Yes. And one may just be wondering, when you talk about asal communities or asal areas, yep. first of all, what does this abbreviation mean, and which kind of communities or places are this? Yeah, so uh, asal uh, means uh, arid and semi-arid areas. Okay. Yeah, so, and this, uh, in our country, for example, uh, over 89% of our country is asal. It is arid over and semi-arid. Over 89%. Over 89%. So that means these areas are characterized by low and reliable and reliable rainfall. Mm -hmm. They are areas that are not pro good for agriculture, like mm -hmm. farming or crop production, but they are good for extensive livestock production. So basically, that is what you know our the asal or arid and semi-arid lands means. All right. Yeah. Yes, and just as I mentioned, we are talking to Jacqueline Kemboi. <coughs> landscape restoration coordinator just dig it foundation kenya our conversation centered on matters climate change trying to look at some of those ways that we can use to mitigate the adverse of uh, uh, adverse effects of climate change she'll be talking to us about um, the measures we can employ and of course you fully know well that the adverse effects of climate change is what has brought us to the kind of position that we are in as a country and not just as kenya but we are also talking about the horn of africa these are countries that have really been affected by the adverse effects of drought. Just yesterday, the president committed two billion more in addition to 3.2 to salvage this situation. So these are some of those issues that we'll be conversing um, with my guest. And just before we are fixing that, we are trying to understand more about this ASAL areas. And yep. you talked about 89%. So one would think this big percentage yeah. of our country yep. is actually ASAL, the arid and semi-arid land areas? Yeah, sure. So <coughs> when you look at uh, like 10 or 20 years back, yes. you know, we used to say 80% of our land is yeah. arid and semi-arid. Yeah. But now because of the effects of climate change, okay. more and more areas are becoming, you know, th they are being Im Im impacted by drought. More and more species are being lost. More and more areas are becoming bare. Mm -hmm. So the moment you have bare areas, the areas that cannot regenerate by itself, mm -hmm. you know, then you can consider that area an, a semi-arid area because now they are now receiving less rainfall. The, the trees or the, or the grass species that are there cannot, you know, regenerate the way they used to be before mm -hmm. so as time goes by as these effects of climate change you know ravage we are getting more and more areas becoming you know 
those now arid and semi arid areas like now they are receiving now more rainfall they are now you know being impacted more by drought yeah, yeah? yeah. yeah. then you see also the soil fertility for example exactly. because of you know the effects of you know, soil being carried away by you know floods by yeah. rains most water is lost through runoff mm -hmm. you know the soil fertility is also lost so you find even the farmers by themselves mm -hmm. when the farmers who are doing you know crop production because of the loss of soil fertility you cannot produce an, uh, anything in that area then how will you consider that area to be okay yeah if it is not producing it's like you know when you have the high potential areas uh -huh. which now it's about 11 percent mm. you know they receive more rainfall quite, all the time that's and quite a low number it's a low number and now that's why we need or to like really focus yeah. on on these 89 percent because now the, the number is increasing the percentage is increasing mm. so in the next 10 or 20 years where are we going to be if we do not do anything mm -hmm. yeah I mean, that's why we have you here. We really need to find solutions. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. And I can only read, read the passion in your, in your voice as you talk about this. Yes. But also, talk to me about um, the extent of land degradation in these ASAL areas because it looks like actually in this conversation we really wrap ourselves around these areas because 89% yes. is really quite a huge percentage thinking about the entire country and this is the kind of percentage you're talking about yeah so what is the extent of degradation in this areas the extent is huge and I know millions and millions of hectares have been degraded and they are con they continuously get degraded on a daily basis okay. when you look at our counties right now we are talking of over you know about over 25 counties being 29 actually, 29 actually 29 counties being asked when we were promulgating our new constitution in 2010 the, when devolution came in we were talking of 23 asal counties in Kenya mm. now it's just like 10 years down the line we have 29 asal counties and actually these six have just been added recently recently of this yeah it's because now they cannot produce they cannot produce food their soils maybe they are degraded they, they, they receive low rainfall year in year out so people also need to be aware that mm -hmm. there this is happening we need to like now change can we have also diversity of crops that we are growing can we look at species that can you know can withstand this uh, can 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 use less water species that can withstand now the cu current climate that we are mm -hmm. at the moment mm -hmm. so if we are able to diversify and use species that are well adapted now to the current uh, situation that we are having mm -hmm. then we can you know reverse it and even have food within our reach but if people continue with the norm that we've been having like just growing potatoes every day and maize. and maize every day and they are, the rains are, are are going down and down each and every day exactly. why can't we now move to you know crops that can we start drought like sorghum millet for example okay. yeah so it depends now with an area like which area are you what crops can be grown mm -hmm. apart from now if it is maize apart from maize what can we diversify and so that we do not depend eh? yeah alternative so that we don't depend on maize alone if maize fail then we have something else that we can that that can help us mm -hmm. in terms of getting food i hear you yeah. and we'll come to that div diversification of crops momentarily yeah. Yeah. but before we get there let me come back to the organization yeah. talk to me about what exactly you do in terms of this mitigative measures because you've touched on a good number of issues here and there that we could employ yeah but what are you doing as just dig it so as just dig it we are uh, ex uh, implementing simple technologies of water harvesting okay so for example we have uh, we, something we call soil bands other people call them earth smiles mm -hmm. this is just a simple technology where you just need a jembe or a spade just dig a piece a small area and then you scoop the soil and create an embankment that create a, a, in a semicircular manner mm -hmm. in such a way that it faces the direction of the flow of run of water so that when it rains the water can be captured by this by these uh, soil bands and inside the soil bands we plant grass species so when you plant grass species that are indigenous and are well adapted to that climate to that area with that little water that the band will capture the grasses will germinate and they will establish and you can have a regreened area within a short period of time mm -hmm. so that is one secondly is uh, we have something we call a uh, farmer managed uh, natural regeneration mm. so farmer managed nat natural regeneration is just a uh, regenerating trees from the existing tree stumps that people may be cut and you know when people cut and do, do charcoal production or just cut the trees and do them for fencing yeah. so with this tree stump because they have already established roots there are some uh, scopies, scopiesing, uh stems that come from the sides of the main stem with that one you can maintain one two or three stems two or three stems that can grow and become a huge tree so you can have a tree in an area within a short time by just protecting that 
Tristam that is copying. Mm -hmm. So and so that means you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from scratch. Okay. And also there's something called assisted natural regeneration. That is just from the seeds that are germinating. Mm -hmm. So when a seed germinates, for example, in an area and talk of assaults because that is the area that I, I have experienced in yes. and I've worked yes. for a long time in those yes. areas. You have seeds that germinate from just you know they germinate naturally. When they germinate, that means they are already adapted to that environment. They are adapted to that climate. So if you can protect that tree that is germinating. In your area, just spot some trees that are germinating. Protect them from being eaten by goats or, or any other livestock. Mm -hmm. you can, that tree can grow. You How know? do you do that? When you're living with all these things together, you have the animals there, um, the trees are there, you even have children, for instance. How do you protect yes. them? Yes, so you have indigenous, th th there are a lot of indigenous knowledge in our communities. Okay. So some people will just do a fence, you know, around it, mm -hmm. just pr protect that tree from, you know, being graced by livestock. Mm -hmm. Some people will just educate their children that, please, that tree is being, uh, being, being, being monitored, we are, we are protecting it, so please do not cut it. Mm -hmm. So, and in most cases, we always mark it. We mark it with a piece of cloth that even when you see it, and we also create awareness within the community that when you see the tree that is marked red or green, mm -hmm. please do not touch it. It is under regeneration. Mm -hmm. We are bringing back trees in our community, and please do not touch it. And if you want to use it, you can prune it. So with that tree, you can just continue pruning it. And the moment you prune a tree, it grows very fast. And with those prunings, you can either use it to, you know, as a fence, for example, and even to enclose <coughs> that, that, that tree seedling that you, you are protecting. Mm -hmm. You can use it as, as firewood. So people will not be moving for long distance to get firewood. If you have trees that you are pruning each and every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that will become an advantage because now you do not need to use a lot of resources to, okay. to, 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 pro, to monitor it or mm -hmm. to protect it or to conserve it. It's a it. question of understanding knowledge. Yes, it is knowledge. Correct. People now need to know that there's this technology, there's this knowledge that you can use so that you can regreen an area or regenerate trees within your community within a short time. And then uh, another intervention, which is also simple, is uh, the grass seed banks. Grass seed banks are just simple, small farms where you plow and, and fence it. And we are mostly implementing it with the Maasai women. And in these areas, these women groups, they plant this grass, and when this grass mature, because they, I've said they are well adapted to that so environment. There's, so there's so with the role of women in this mitigation. Yes, there's role of women in this mitigation. So with these grasses, because they just, they just need little rains. With little rains, they can sprout, and they can, you know, grow to maturity. Mm -hmm. They can harvest grass seeds from it, and they can sell. And by that, you can increase the income. Women can get an income from it, but at the same time, you are restoring an area. Mm -hmm. So those are just the simple technologies that we are using. Mm -hmm. But there's one key thing that you need to put into consideration. Okay. Even though you have these interventions in place, one key important thing is management. Grazing management must be put in place mm -hmm. for sustainability. Otherwise, if, even if you just put all the resources, do it, and then you just leave it, you go home and say, I've done it. You know, livestock will come, wildlife will come, and they will eat it, and we'll go back to where we were before. Mm -hmm. So grazing management or management in general is very important for sustainability. All right, I yes. hear you. Jackie, I want us to take a very quick breather, but uh, before we get to do that, yes. I also want us to be thinking about COP27 is coming yep. uh, in terms of climate change. Yep. President talked about 5 billion trees yep. by 2027, yep. 10 by 32. Yep. How can we do that? And also increase of funds in the Ministry of Environment. Yep. How do we manage that? Yep. So even as you marinate on that, that one. Yep. We take a very quick breather. We recall with plenty more of this conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program. You're still on Good Morning Kenya, holding court with my guest, that is Jacqueline Kemboi, Landscape Restoration Coordinator at Just Dig It Foundation Kenya, of course, talking about matters of climate change, looking at how we can mitigate the issues and the adverse effects of climate change that intertwined with the drought, ravaging drought in our country. Now, Jackie, before you we took that break, you're talking to us about some of those measures that you're doing as an organization, yes. and you strongly touched on... Um, 
planting of trees in one way or the other. The president has also committed to this 5 billion trees by 2027, 10 billion by 2032, 15 billion again in the next five years. And you know, this continues. So then one would ask, um, we have been sort of like planting trees over time. Why are we thinking about this at this point in time? What have we not been doing correctly that the president is now committing to such one would think kind of a huge uh, project, so to speak? Yeah, so thank you. I think that is a great initiative, planting trees. But uh, one thing we need to put in mind uh, is the sustainability of those trees okay. so that we do not plant trees and then at the end of the day, we have all the trees dying. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing we need to put in place. And then secondly, we need to look at the what species are we planting. Mm -hmm. Species are site specific and species vary with, you know, water uh, use efficiency. So there are species that are good for dry lands. For example, because we are talking of assals, because now if 89% of our country is yeah. assals, then let's focus on the assals. Exactly. So we are planting trees in these areas, for example. What kind of trees are we planting? Mm -hmm. What are they used? Because you also have to look at the use in the community for so the let me people just to get adopt this. it. Yeah. Let, me, let me get this. And also yeah. for the benefit of our viewers, when you talk about planting trees, it's not just blanket. We are planting yeah. trees. Yeah, because not. you've constantly mentioned something about specificity yeah. in respect to area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now th that is key. If you have a species that is specific to that area, mm -hmm. it can withstand any environmental challenge. All right. And if you so we can, need to start from there. We need to start from there. You know, have the right species for the right place. Okay. That is one. Secondly, is who is going to like plant these trees? It is the people on the local. The local people who are planting the trees, or you mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Why are you planting that tree? What is it? To, what what benefit does it have to you? Mm. If for me it doesn't have any benefit, I will not even have time for it. Mm. I will be looking for maybe food to try to, you know, pl plant my crops which can, can help me feed my family. Mm. But if that tree has importance to me, I will manage it and I will take care of it. So the tree has to be site specific, but it also has to have an importance to that specific community or to those specific people, mm -hmm. especially for the pastoral communities, for example. If you want them to plant trees in an area, mm. that tree has to be you know, fodder for livestock, because they are livestock keeping people. Yes. It has to provide fodder for livestock. Mm -hmm. It has also to be maybe fruits for the, for the family because to improve nutrition in, in, in the family. So it should have those, you know, importance to the people. And also the locals should also understand that tree, the importance so of that, that tree. it means that we are not just thinking about climate change holistically as yeah. to why we are planting trees to mitigate the yeah. adverse effects of that, yeah. but also we are looking at the former. If it's an area, for example, in an area in Kajiado, yeah an area in Amboseli, yeah. somewhere in uh, Tiati, for example, yeah. you need to be thinking which trees would do well in Tiati, yeah. which trees would do well in Samburu. How would people of Samburu benefit in terms of food production for themselves and their livestock as we curb? Yes. And also okay. you have to put in mind that which, you know, you have to look at check and balances. Right. Is it easy to plant a tree uh -huh. or is it easy to regenerate a tree? Okay. So which one is cheap? Which one can work? Mm -hmm. So you need to have local people also contributing to that, not mm -hmm. just you going to pump information or, you know, here are trees, please plant. Yeah. You also have to get information from the community because those are the people who are, you know, going to be with those trees for the rest of their lives, for example. Mm -hmm. So if regenerating a tree is easy in that area or, you know, assisting the germinating seedlings in that area to grow, mm -hmm. then we can go for that. In areas where we can plant trees, you know, we have like, for example, the private farms where people have, you know, they can easily plant their trees and protect, then let's plant trees in that area. So there's a lot of things that we need to incorporate yeah. even before we can say that. Now you, as Doreen, plant, plant this trees. tree, plant this tree. I get you. Yeah. And I'm, I want to believe that relevant stakeholders also listening to this yes. because, again, the president also pledged and committed to increasing the fund yeah. in the Ministry of Environment yeah. for this purpose yeah. of planting trees. And a good number of Kenyans were asking, so then how do we monitor that? Yeah. In the event that actually you're given this particular fund and you say that rains didn't come, yeah. so then how do you say, um, you know, trees didn't grow? But then based on what you're telling us, that identifying is actually key because whether or not rains come, for example, at least in one or the other you have solved with the situation sure again talk to us about what you're doing also at just dig it in respect to matters of water and um, conservation because it's also one of those very key yeah. areas so um, in magadi for example i can use it, just use the examples that we, we are uh, implementing yeah. in magadi we are desilting water pans with the communities in old and shompole conservancy mm -hmm. if 
in rangeland for example if you want to do rangeland rehabilitation these are areas where we are rehabilitating for the purpose of livestock production and for the communities in that area when you look at pasture or vegetation there's you have also to look at water mm -hmm. how will these people get water and when you are doing the water interventions you also have to consider the issues of grazing management so that animals will not be passing an area which you do not want them to pass for a certain time period of time mm -hmm. to access water so you have to make sure that the water is put in strategic places where the pastoral communities can get and you know when you involve these people they mm -hmm. can easily tell you that this area it has been you know when it rains you get a lot of water ponding in this area mm -hmm. why can't we you know use just some little resources to expand it and they're always willing to you know even to contribute their effort and you know their labor mm -hmm. to do it as long as you just you know support them mm -hmm. know their th their needs maybe they need food they need what they need you know maybe cash mm -hmm. you can just support them and they can do you know the desilting of those water pans and I also uh, you know it's just a pledge whereby you know we have the county governments for example yes. in these areas mm -hmm. it is always important that we can you know in every even financial year let's just do something major for these communities for example in terms of water mm -hmm. yeah if we can do two you know two water pans huge in, function yeah in a certain area it's very beneficial to those communities yeah yeah, yeah. all right now even as you talk about the issue of water, yeah. uh, the weatherman has talked about how at least for some few days we shall experience some bit of rainfall, yeah. but not to the much expectancy. Yeah. And you're already seeing that some areas here and there already, you know, floods coming in. And then yeah. one would wonder, we've not experienced rainfall in a long while. So now we are at least getting benefits of wheat shortly. What can we do in terms of sensitization for people to understand that they need to be harvesting this water at least to mitigate the effects that may come later when you don't have rainfall at all? Yeah, so uh, in Just Dig It, uh, we really do a lot of uh, communication. Okay. And communication is key yeah. in enabling people to, you know, get to know the information or, you know, sensitizing them, creating awareness among the communities. Yes. So if we can create awareness, tell people that you can do this intervention to harvest water, you can do this, then people will, will are willing to do it. For example, let me just take you back to the, to the soil bands, yeah. which uh, we are implementing. We have thousands and thousands of them. So if one band can hold, you know, a certain amount of water you have two you have 10 you have 100 you can imagine how much water will you harvest in that area how much water will infiltrate infiltrate in this into the soil and will not be lost through runoff and how much water will not go into the streams to, to cause floods mm -hmm. so if people get to know these interventions if people get to know that you can harvest you know water in this certain manner by not using a lot of money or you do not need machineries for example because now that is an issue if you you think if communities are thinking about machineries and you know they cannot afford it but th if you can give them knowledge or information that instead of thinking of machineries you can use these simple technologies to harvest water mm -hmm. then communities will will will, uh, will adopt it and you know you can have water within you know when within a short or a long rain season another thing for example is the check dams and we are doing that in magadi mm -hmm. for for example you find there's a, a stream and most of the time water is ponding if we can do those check dams in that area the water can you know remain uh, in that area for a some certain period of time and mm -hmm. assist you know the communities and livestock yeah. yeah yeah and those are just simple like if you check them is just getting stones and piling them to ensure that the water you know remain there for some time you know mm -hmm. so that the water does not you know flow with force but it can just flow gently and some can remain for the pastoral communities to use it so mm -hmm. with those simple technologies you know with that information if you can you know share that information with the communities through media through you know tvs through sms through you know movie road shows storytelling people can get to you know to uh, embrace these technologies exactly yeah and again just as i said that is why we have you here as an expert <laughs> to talk to us about this but also there's something that i came ac across and i'd want you to also address it this is human activities for instance you're talking about burning of fossil fuels like coal oil and gas and you're seeing particularly countries in east africa kenya tanzania also this is one of those things that they really sort of i should say embrace yeah. and it's really causing negative effects in fact when you talk about climate change we really link it so much to this as well, burning yeah. of this um, fossil fuels like the coal, oil and gas. Yeah. What can we use as an alternative? Much as we talk about um, Africa only emitting 5% of this gas emissions, but what can we do to reduce on that? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are several ways, and I have seen organizations, you know, uh, coming up with some, you know, energy saving, for example, uh, stoves. Mm -hmm. 
okay. where people can, you know, use a uh, little firewood to, you know, uh, cook, for example. And uh, it's just, you know, creating, still on creating awareness. People can, you know, can, you can, they can easily adopt it, but, you know, when they do not know the know-how, yes. it becomes an issue. And then now you have, you, when you have these, uh, the issues of fossil fuel, for example, mm -hmm. these, you know, huge countries producing, you know, fossil fuel and, you know, having great impacts on, in, in, in our environment, for example. You know, we need to, like, come up with those solutions. Like, mm -hmm. how can we, you know, mitigate this? Mm -hmm. How can we, you know, like, give an incentive to this community so that they can even plant more trees mm -hmm. so that we can, you know, mitigate those effects of the fossil fuel. I hear yeah. you. Now that you touch on the planting of trees again, looks like this one of your <laughs> strong areas, <laughs> your forte, I shall say. Yeah. Let, let me also pick your mind on this particular issue, the Shamba system. I know it has died down a bit, but it was one of those things that really caused quite the conversation there, the time the deputy president talked about yep. this and this has been a system that is not a new system actually it's it has system. been there since time immemorial i think it, actually, even even since we got independence but yep. different regimes bringing it removing bringing it removing it was finally removed during the reign of uh, kibaki and we've been that way up until when it was just mentioned by the deputy president yep. but then one would argue that it's kind of a good system kind of a bad system depending on where you want to sit yep. also looking at the effects of drought you yep. could benefit in terms of food and also benefit in terms of you know growing trees to adv to to curb effects of climate change what would you say in respect to this and also ad ad as you addressed that in terms of policies what can we do yeah so uh, with this issue of shamba system it is very interesting because it depends on where you sit mm -hmm. and it can be good or bad but now it depends on you know the policies and the regulations that are there if we have really good policies and regulations that are enforced yeah. you know i think the issue is enforcement because we can have rules we can have regulations we can have policies but if it is not enforced mm -hmm. in the right manner then it is not a good system then it becomes a good system for example the some shamba system if we can yes allow the local people to access the forest to plant crops how sure are you that they will not get into the forest and cut the trees mm -hmm. and you know burn charcoal for example mm -hmm. how will you regulate that i think that is the most uh, important thing that we need to also put in mind that if we are allowing community for example to do these plant crops and they can you know after two years definitely the trees will chase them away yeah. but now how are you sure are you that uh, we'll they will not the they, they, they will not they will not touch the forest you can have rangers on site for example yes. you can have rangers there manning the site but we are all humans okay. how sure are you that i will not give you as a ranger like 500 shillings to allow me to you know mm -hmm. so those, those are the things we need to look into before we can you know allow a certain uh, a certain system you know to take place mm. so i think the government also needs to you know regulate and ensure that we have enforcement if people know that there are real pen penalties if you go against the rules that are that, that, that are there and there are huge penalties on that and you've seen it somebody has been you know find uh, millions of money for doing that then you are not going to do it mm -hmm. so it's on the enforcement part if they can enforce those policies those regulations then it can be a good system yeah yeah so it's just a matter of thinking around it yeah. it's it's something that he brought up and you're still conversing around yeah. it to see in what way can it be beneficial at the end of the day yeah. for us as a country mm -hmm. there's also one thing that's one thing that we've had constantly even as you talk about the issues of drought because of course I mean climate change yeah. we are listening to Red Cross talking about you know uh, counties in uh, Alat counties in Alam I know this is holistically 29 counties which yeah. you know have been affected by this issue but when you talk about Alat and Alam face what exactly are we meaning and to what extent is the situation dire yeah so when you talk about the alert or alarm face, for example, yes. it depends with the situation. Okay. There are some people who, for example, they are able, they can access food. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could not produce uh, this year because of the, the, the drought, but they can produce in the next season when they receive rains. So maybe their soils are still good, you know, and, you know, maybe they can get in reach to, you know, do irrigation, for example. But there are those situation whereby you just look at the soils, the rivers are drying, you know, and we, we've seen it over, over time. Okay. So it's also something that they've been monitoring over, over time. time. For you to say that this is an alarm or an alert situation, it has to have been monitored over time so that you can give that specific, uh, that specification that this is, this county is on alert or this county is on alarm face. Uh -huh. So it is monitoring over time and seeing how they can bounce back. If mm -hmm. it cannot bounce back, then, you know, you're going to that, you know, complete red. <laughs> red. You're going to that red. Mm -hmm. But if you can still bounce back even with little showers for example then you can you know 
remain on the the the, 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 the alarm, the, not, the really alarm the not, not on the alarm. So then, are you doing anything in terms of uh, sensitization again when you talk about um, diversifying of our crops production? Because you talked about how we have so much been accustomed to certain types of crops, but with the effects of climate change, we need to start rethinking. Yeah. What are you doing with respect to to that? Yeah. So for for just dig it, we are really focusing mainly on pastoral areas where people deal with livestock mm -hmm. and so now we are looking at the pastures which is very important so what kind of pastures are we dealing with okay so now you get you have to get the right species for there there's just like the trees eh? the, just like the trees so right. you have to get the right species that is well adapted to that area then now you can you know that's just a form of and another form of you know diversification now is looking at you know you cannot use one intervention for example to 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 solve climate change you mm -hmm. also have to look you have to diversify in terms of interventions you know and combine those interventions so one intervention may not you know give you the results but if you can combine several interventions so again then diversify even in interventions interventions yeah all right yeah so, so everything diversify don't be static no. just be dynamic yeah. as you sort of like begin to wind down jackie yeah. cop 27 beginning next week things are going to be like a three or four days yeah. um uh, you know forum there yeah. the theme this year being delivering for the people and the planet this has been an annual kind of event yeah. the conference of parties touching yeah. on climate change what should like the globe expect so that it just doesn't become peop uh, nations or states coming together to deliberate on climate change and we can barely see much in terms of implementation yeah so in my own view i'm just hoping that these states especially from these high-end countries mm -hmm. they are seeing the dire situation in africa mm -hmm. they are seeing you know drought ravaging uh, communities mm -hmm. people dying because of hunger mm -hmm. animals dying because of hunger we have livestock you know we have wildlife dying because of you know hunger you know and that is going to affect us even in the tourism sector for example mm -hmm. we have wildfires for example the other day we had Kilimanjaro burning mm -hmm. so those effects I really hope that those high-end countries are seeing the effects that are in Africa and when they come to this COP27 they should you know discuss or negotiate in a way that it is going to have a positive impact for us mm -hmm. so in terms of cli uh, climate action and financing mm -hmm. we are really hoping and for me I'm because I have, largely, eh? yeah, I have that passion of you know, you know, regenerating uh, degraded landscapes. Mm. If they can really look into that financing and finance Africa to be able to adopt these technologies and you know implement them, so that we can you know reverse climate change. As much as we are contributing less and they are contributing more to climate mm -hmm. change, then they should really play their part and ensure that you know we get the right financing, we get the right, and we have the technologies with us. Yes. So it's for us, it's just you know the financing, and we can roll on. With the technologies uh -huh. I yeah. like I like what you've said that much as we are contributing less of course you have a part to pay, to, to, play, to play but yeah. also they should do their part because yeah. <laughs> they're equally contributing <laughs> sure, much. Sure, yeah. thank you so much Jackie that was such a cogent discussion there at least now we understand where we are as a country what more we need to do to mitigate these issues of climate change it's yeah. an ongoing crisis actually and that's why these conversations are very pertinent at this hour Jacqueline Kemboy has been my guest at this hour talking about um, matters of uh, climate change just land restoration to mitigate um, climate change of course this intertwined with the adverse effects of drought that you're currently facing as a country good place to end this conversation but also quite important for me to inform you that we are equally following, following up on some of these stories for you for instance the East Africa Community Regional Force flag handover will be taking place today this is at the Embakasi garrison so the minute we get that link we shall be crossing over there to just uh, you know prune you and prime you on the latest or uh, from that particular end but good Good place to also end good morning kenya from me and on behalf of the entire team asante sana we always appreciate your valued company 6 30 all the way um to 10 a.m but now we want to pave way for parliament which is coming up next good morning